perfectly on time, so it's um, uh, I'm going to take the floor, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, my friend and our colleague from the north, um, Sarah Rodriguez, who will be giving today's talk, The Love Surgeon, A Story of Trust, Harm, and the Limits of Medical Peer Review. Sarah Rodriguez, an associate professor of instruction in the Global Health Studies Program in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. She's a lecturer in the Department of Medical Education at the Feinberg School of Medicine and a core faculty member in Medical Humanities and the Bioethics Graduate Program at Northwestern University. She teaches courses in globic, glo globic, global bioethics, international perspectives on reproductive and sexual health, and in gender and global health for the Global Health Studies Program and seminars on the history of medicine, the history of women in medicine, the history of epidemics for medical humanities and the bioethics program. She is a medical historian whose research focuses on the history of women's reproductive health, the history of healthcare, especially surgery, and the history of clinical research ethics since the early 20th century and how history has framed current discourse. Her second book, The Love Surgeon, the story of trust, harm, and the limits of medical regulation is from Rutgers University Press. Her first book, Female Circumcision and Clitoridectomy in the United States, A History of Medical Treatment, was published in 2004. Dr. Rodriguez is currently working on the history of the standard care debate regarding the 1990s trials to reduce the likelihood of vertical transmission of HIV from mother to fetus and on the history of episiotomy as a standard of care. Her next project will concern the history of International Confederation of Midwives and Maternal Health. Sarah earned her undergraduate degree at the University of Iowa, went on to develop to get a master's in history of science and medicine at Wisconsin, and earned her PhD at the University of Nebraska. She did two postdoctoral fellowships at Northwestern one in medical humanities and bioethics, and the other one in the Oncofertility Consortium. Sarah is a highly sought out educator and has taught and mentored graduate, undergraduate medical students at numerous institutions, including Northwestern Rush, University of Nebraska, and Des Moines Osteopathic Medical Center. And on a personal level, I can think of no area in medical history that is as dynamic interesting, practical, and relevant as that of gender, sexuality, and women's reproductive health. And it's my pleasure to introduce our colleague and my friend, uh, Dr. Sarah Rodriguez, to give us this fascinating talk on this topic that I uh, promise will be an interesting lesson for all. Thanks, Sarah. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that uh beautiful introduction. I'm very um, humbled by it. So thank you so much, Mindy, for that introduction. And thank you so much for having me um, uh, speak about the love surgeon. Um, and I'm going to talk today mostly about medical peer review, but also about consent and informed consent and changing ideas about informed consent to a certain degree too. Um, oops. So I'm going to start off by saying other than as Mindy said, I do have a book that just came out last year about this topic. So that is my, um, that's my one disclosure uh, for today. And then two, I'm just gonna post briefly the learning objectives for this lecture. So I'm gonna start off by telling you a little bit about the love surgeon who is actually a man by the name of Dr. James Burt. Dr. Burt was a, um, a physician, an obstetrician gynecologist who began practicing in Dayton, Ohio in the mid 1950s. Um, and he began calling what he performed love surgery on women after they gave birth. And he developed this, he claims, he claimed um, as a variation of episiotomy repair. And he started developing what he then terms love surgery in the late 1960s through the 1970s. Now, for those of you who don't know, episiotomy is the cut physicians made at the opening of the vagina going down, which either directly down or um, directionally down. Uh, toward the rectum and it was done during the second phase of labor with the intention that it would open up the vaginal canal and open up the entrance of the vagina to better facilitate the birth of the baby more rapidly, facilitate the birth of the baby. And these were then stitched afterwards. And the idea behind episiotomy was that it was easier to repair 
than a tear. These were incredibly common in the United States in the 50s, 60s, and 1970s. So the fact that he was doing a variation on this and, and, um, and sewing it up wasn't the uncommon part of this necessarily. What was perhaps uncommon is by around 1975, Bert begins significantly has significantly modified the episiotomy repair, and I'll show you a picture of it shortly, beyond what he was now calling an episiotomy repair, and he starts now calling it something different. He starts calling it the love surgery. And he starts offering it. He had been performing it just on women who had been giving birth that he was delivering. Um, but he now begins by about the mid-1970s, he begins offering it as a surgical elective. And this surgical elective upon, for women upon whom he was not delivering a baby, um, although he continues to perform it on his obstetric patients until probably the late 1980s. Uh, we know that Burt performed love surgery until about 1987, though by the late 80s, he definitely um, dropped down his performing of surgery in general, but in specific this one. And in October 1988, a group of women upon whom he performed love surgery, who were suing him for malpractice, accused him on CBS's primetime news show, West 57th, of operating on them without their informed consent, uh, uh, of receiving an operation that resulted in their having chronic pain, chronic yeast infections and other infections, and for some an inability to have vaginal sex. After receiving this negative national exposure, the Ohio State Medical Board charged Burt with multiple violations and set up a hearing regarding his medical license. Under pressure from the lawsuits and now the medical board, in January 1989, Dr. Burt voluntarily surrendered his medical license and stopped practicing medicine altogether. Now, as I noted at the beginning, I published a book on this story last year, uh, but years before this book came out, um, in 2013 to be exact, while I was still researching this book, I had an article published about Dr. Burt that appeared in the Archives of Sexual Behavior. My abstract for this article appeared in PubMed a few when the publication appeared in print. In November 2012, Jezebel, which is a feminist blog, picked up on my not yet published article and pulled from the PubMed abstract. So per Erin Gloria Ryan, who's the author of this blog post and was writing for Jezebel, um, Ryan latched on to part of my abstract, the part concerning the local medical communities, writing that, quote, perhaps the worst part of the story is how other doctors and medical professionals knew what Dr. Burt was up to, but did nothing, end quote. So Ryan, in addition to writing that physicians did nothing, she further pulled from my abstract that initially the hospital where Burt operated did not initially require him to use a consent form. For Ryan, the hospital, quote, didn't require medical consent forms for the procedure for the first 12 years it was being performed, end quote. Now, Ryan did not interview me for this story, and obviously she didn't read the entire article because this was the pre-publication abstract that she was reading, um, though she did nicely put the tag to the PubMed article uh, at, in this. Someone could have at some point gone and done that. Um, she did, however, follow the typical reporting on James Burt, which has appeared in popular accounts about him since the late 1980s. There was a wealth of coverage after the CBS show. Um, in the next about six months after that October CBS show, People Magazine covers him and um, Good Housekeeping covers him. So there's a lot of, and the New York Times covers him. There's a lot of sort of popular press reporting about him. And she definitely follows what in particular was the sort of angle in those magazines directed primarily for women's audience. And that is that women uh, experience an experimental surgery without their consent and in particular, that other doctors in the community knew about it and did nothing. That they, in effect, abdicated their responsibility to protect them from a bad and errant doctor. Essentially, that they knew that they had a provincial responsibility in regulating their peer and they abdicated doing so. So you can see that, like I said, and this is a Red Book article, and I'm Sorry, this is, this is one of those in hindsight as a historian, I really should make two copies of things before I start. I'm old school where I have to print it out and like highlight as you can see. So in hindsight, I'm wishing I would have done like another copy and used a different copy for showing people. But now you can see work in progress of how I was thinking about this article. But indeed, this was a thrust of articles like this. My gynecologist butchered me. Um, a Woman's Day article, My Gynecologist from Hell. This was very much the angle, particular magazines directed at women. And this narrative was used again by Ryan 24 years after these sorts of stories appeared 
And I'm going to say this narrative plays really well because it sounds right. It sounds correct to us, for it frames the Burt story as a horror story, in particular, any woman could experience. And we can see that again, this per 1989 article from Red Book with the title, My Gynecologist Butchered Me, as well as from the beginning of a Mademoiselle article that started, quote, this is a story about a group of women and the doctor they trusted, but it could be about any of us, end quote. So it plays then into many fears we have regarding doctors, okay? In particular, that doctors will do something for their own benefit, that we'll be asleep and we won't know, or we won't understand what's being done to us, that we, the patient, won't know. And this plays on a lot of fears that we have. And I'm showing you this, because I it's, it's a couple blocks from where I live and I kept walking past it with my dog and think this plays on this sort of, this, this Halloween display plays on that fear of not knowing and having a doctor do experiments on us or having them doing something unknown to us on our bodies, that is a that is a cultural fear that this exhibit obviously plays on, but more seriously that the BERTS or response to BERT was also responding to. This and this fear is compounded by the idea that doctor, other doctors will know about this and do nothing to stop the errant doctor. <clears throat> so this then sets up some interesting questions. And I'm gonna say, when I first entered the Burt story, which was a while ago when I started researching this, I went in also expecting, like all of the things I was reading um, about being published that were primary sources, these newspaper articles and these journal articles and women's magazines in particular, going and expecting that that's what I was going to find too, that this was going to be a story of doctors abdicating their responsibility to not stop a peer who is behaving uh, in an abhorrent manner. Um, and as historian Susan Reverby has noted, it's, it is difficult when you're a historian to write about historical events that actually draw forth really strong emotions, such as my gynecologist butchered me. Really, these really strong emotions, um, it's difficult to escape from this, as she puts it, quote, this moral outrage and the stock assumptions about what had happened, end quote. So the stock assumption, of course, regarding Bert has been that he was a case, this was a case of a lone clinician acting outside the norms of medicine by experimenting on unsuspecting women who did not give consent while other doctors looked on. That is what the Burt story is supposed to be about. But beyond being historically problematic, framing the story in this way leads to a dead end. For this frame fails to include questions the Burt case does bring forth historically as well as still today, including questions in particular about medical peer review and regulation, and these questions still persist. So in this talk, I'm gonna to start to unpack some of these stock assumptions regarding BERT. In particular, per Ryan, the stock assumptions that other doctors and medical professionals knew what Dr. BERT was up to, but did nothing, that BERT performed an experimental surgery out of normative bounds, and that consent was not obtained. Instead, examine the story from a more nuanced perspective, or perhaps really what we can call as a historically more messy perspective, that, that places his love surgery practice within the historical context of consent to medical procedures, particularly routine hospital procedures in the 1950s to the 1970s, within normative surgical development and within normative medical peer review among clinicians before considering the limits of peer oversight as illustrated by the Burt case. So I'm gonna begin though with a little, a brief overview of how Burt developed love surgery. Um, and then talk a little bit more about um, the, the implications of the surgery. So as an obstetrician in the 1950s, Bert regularly performed an episiotomy. Um, and like I already said, episiotomies were incredibly common, um, commonly practiced in this country with some hospitals reporting rates of as high as 85%, particularly for new moms. And with national rates ranging between 50 to 90% through the 1960s and 1970s. But because the cut, the episiotomy cut was made, went into the vagina, an episiotomy repair stitched both the outer tissue on the woman's perineum as well as the immediate internal part of the vaginal tissue. So stitches made during the repair could also essentially tighten the entrance to the vagina. Between 1954 and 1966, approximately, Bert began to make variations on episiotomy repair upon his obstetric patients, adding a few more stitches to make the vaginal opening smaller and tighter. And then in 1966, according to Bert, he discovered two things. First was the important role played by the clitoris in female sexual response, thanks to the recently published um, information, the recently published book by William Masters and Virginia Johnson, 
that it dedicated a whole chapter to the importance of the clitoris in female sexual response and pointed out it was the only organ in the human body of any human, either male or female bodies, that sole purpose was sexual. Second, in addition to him reading this research in the 1960s, was that according to Bert, his patients were telling him that they had better sexual response after birth than they did before. And he claims he had not told them that he was doing anything different than a normal episiotomy repair. These discoveries then led Bert to conclude that women's bodies, women's bodies, were not an anatomically ideal for heterosexual missionary position penetrative sex. In particular, Bert decided the clitoris was too far from the vaginal opening for that organ to receive adequate stimulation from the penis during heterosexual missionary penetrative sex. So Bert began building up skin tissue between the vaginal opening. And by doing so, he found he moved the opening closer to the vagina, closer, the opening of the vagina closer to the clitoris, an organ he also, by sometime in the 1970s, starts circumcising. So again, not removing the clitoris, but removing the clitoral hood to expose the clitoris. So by 1975, Burt claimed to have performed love surgery in one of its various stages on more than 4,000 women. I'm going to say the veracity of that statement is entirely reliant upon Burt saying that he did this on about 4,000 women. As a note, though, he was a very popular ob in Dayton, Ohio. So even though I can't verify that it was 4,000 women, the fact that he was a very popular ob makes me feel that it probably is within the realm of possibility that that's how many women he operated upon. So in her Jezebel post concerning Bert, Ryan stated that the hospital where Bert performed most of his surgeries did not provide a consent form for it for the first 12 years he practiced it, meaning the years before July 1979 when the hospital began requiring a special surgical surgery specific consent form for this surgery. So I'm going to return to the surgery specific consent form shortly, but now I want to focus just on the issue of whether upon women where he was performing love surgery on um, and whether he should have had some sort of in, um, specific informed consent before this 1979 requirement, um, whether there should have that should have been happening, whether it had been normative for a physician to have acquired such a consent form. And I'm going to say, if by sort of thinking of consent as we're thinking of it now, um, I very much doubt that that would have been, it would have been seen as a problem before then, okay? Bert did stated that he did not tell or ask his patients he was doing anything different from a variation on a episiotomy repair. And that in itself is not, was not something that was not, not normative. That in itself was actually fairly normative. That Bert did not ask or seek um, or tell his patients he was even doing an episiotomy would have been completely normative in the 1970s as well. This was not something physicians requested permission to perform an episiotomy for. Indeed, that Bert did not inform his patients or obtain their consent was also rather normative behavior for within medical practice from the 1950s through the 1960s and into the 1970s. Bert performed episiotomy repair in the hospital following birth and both the episiotomy as well as its repair were considered such a normative part of giving birth few would have considered the necessity of asking permission to perform an episiotomy or asking permission to perform a repair. Indeed, because of its routine nature, this was probably true of episiotomy, episiotomy repair until at least the 1990s and perhaps to the turn of the 21st century. In fact, a 2006 survey revealed that of the 25% of women who had undergone episiotomy, 73% said they were not asked if they wanted one or not. So episiotomies, like a good deal of medical care happening in a hospital during this time, was conducted without explicit consent by the patient. Medical professionals essentially here, speaking just of birth, expected once you've come to the hospital to give birth, the sort of normative routine practice of giving birth was consented to by you being at the hospital to give birth. And so something like an episiotomy was such a normative routine part of hospital care, nobody was getting consent for something like that, or very rarely, I shouldn't ever say never, very rarely was a physician getting consent for something like that. James Burt then, when he was performing his version of episiotomy repair through the 19, mid 1970s, would not have been out of line with normative routine parts of practice of medicine by not asking or telling his patients. Episiotomy and its repair were routine parts of childbirth and hospital and being routine required no special attention. 
But does it matter that as you're seeing here, this was not routine episiotomy repair. This was a different thing altogether. He's cutting things, he's moving things. It was not a normal part of episiotomy repair. And I'm gonna say, does it matter that it wasn't standard? And I'm gonna say, probably not. And to understand why we need to explore more how changes in surgical practice occur. Beginning in the mid 1950s, whoop, I'm sorry, beginning in the mid 1950s and extending through at least the mid 1970s, Dr. Burt made variations on episiotomy repair. And variations on standard surgery were not uncommon during this time and indeed remained part of surgical purview. It appears James Burt's episiotomy repair, however, was by the mid 1970s beyond a variation of standard episiotomy repair based both on Burt's outline of what it involved as well as the opinions of other local doctors. Physicians who later examined some of Burt's patients said the genitals of these women look entirely different. The opening of the vagina was smaller and had been moved about an inch closer to the clitoris. By around 1975 then, Burt's episiotomy repair was seen by Burt as well as other physicians in the community to not be a variation, but rather an innovation on a standard surgery. But an innovation to a surgery does not necessarily mean that innovative surgery is an experimental surgery. A surgical innovation can still be regarded as non-experimental so long as the outcome is considered to be as predictable and as beneficial as the standard surgery from which it is derived. Making innovations to standard surgeries was and remains an important method of improving surgical care. If one patient has a better outcome following innovation, the surgeon may attempt to replicate what was done on one patient in other patients, following these patients' outcomes to develop a case series as a means to track and evaluate the innovative method. One of the most valued aspects of surgery is that chance observations often become validated clinical therapies. Moreover, surgical procedures very often become and be, sorry, became and become acceptable based on good outcomes from observing a series of patients. Many surgical innovations become part of the standard medical practice after only limited, but sometimes no formal evaluation for the procedure's safety or efficacy. Innovation through deviation from standard surgery is how surgeries improve, and the monitoring of these surgeries is how often they are evaluated on whether or not the deviation is an improvement. Surgical development then has largely been experiential. So at least until 1975, Burt's version of an episiotomy repair could be considered a surgical innovation on a standard surgery. The use of this new procedure perhaps warranted a discussion with his patients before the surgery, informing his patients about his innovative surgery and asking whether they wanted to undergo it. He did not do so prior to July 1979, but that he did not do so was also not unusual at this time. Indeed, still today, patients may not be told that they will be or have undergone an innovative surgery. So to summarize, that James Burt did not get consent for his innovation on love surgery was not, and may still not be, unusual, and that the way he developed love surgery was also not, and still is not, unusual. Indeed, one could call both normative. But this does not mean that his peers were ignoring what he was doing regarding love surgery. And probably in no small part, his peers in Dayton, Ohio, um, especially other OB-GYNs and other surgeons, were not ignoring it because in the 1970s, Burt began talking about love surgery a lot and in public. For in 1975, he decided to, um, he decided to uh, his, his, the applicability of his love surgery was not just limited to his obstetric patients, but that actually um, love surgery could, essentially every woman could benefit from love surgery because he regarded the female body as pathological when it came to heterosexual missionary position sex. So his theory was that in 1975, he should open this up to be an elective surgery because every female body actually stood to benefit from this surgery. So he tries to, he goes on to promote this surgery in one, as you're seeing, this is from um, um, the inside jacket of the book cover for a book he supposedly co-wrote with his wife, Joan, over though I think he just wrote it and he self-published and it was called Surgery of Love. He, um, promote, this was one of his routes of promoting the book. He sent the book to the medical schools. He sent it to some other physicians he knew as a way to sort of push the surgery out. Um, I'm also gonna say, as far as this book goes, um, and many times, um, as you can see from, this is from the caption that ran alongside the photo. 
um, Bert very much wanted himself to be seen and regarded and respected as an expert on sexual health. Um, he really wanted to be essentially another William Masters in many ways. So he's pushing this out there. And he also, in some ways, has his couch just being something that is a feminist surgery at some level. But this book and a lot of his writing is very much, this is about the male ego. Uh, and this is very much sort of a benefit, not so much the woman, as it is a benefit to her male partner, um, because he very much sees as sexual uh, responsibility lives with men and men give women orgasms. So he writes this book, he sends this book out. He also hires a public relations firm out of New York City to help him publicize love surgery. And in 1976, he begins offering as an elective for $1,500 plus hospitalization costs. Bert and his surgery were featured in both local and national print news, um, rarely critically, uh, and broadcast media, including favorable articles both in Playboy and Playgirl. And this work apparently paid off. According to Bert, between 1976 and 1978, he had two women come from around the United States, so we're beyond Ohio patients now, around the United States to come and elect to have this surgery. So perhaps if Bert had kept uh, to performing love surgery on just his obstetric patients, or perhaps if he had not been so publicly, and I'm going to say aggressively for this time, this was incredibly unusual at this time to be so aggressive to promote your practice like this. Um, so aggressively seeking new patients to elect for this surgery, his medical peers may not have considered his altering of a standard surgical procedure as anything about which to concern themselves. However, Bert's apparent lack of decorum when it comes to sort of pushing his surgery out, as well as increasingly his lack of selection for who should undergo the surgery. Um, in 1978, Bert himself admitted to only turning down three women for the surgery. Uh, perhaps if he'd contained that, um, it would not have aroused the concern of his peers by, the, by 1976. The case that apparently really aroused the local peers, his peers in Dayton, Ohio, um, was it apparently one, a handful of obstetricians had seen uh, what prompted them to, what that prompted this handful of obstetricians to act was the case of a 19 year old woman who had been married for about a year, who weighed less than hundred pounds and whom Bert had scheduled for love surgery. Speaking anonymously with a reporter in this article from 1978 about this case, one of the concerned physicians stated that it was quote, inconceivable that this operation is recommended for women who plan to have babies, end quote. The young woman scheduled for surgery, the anonymous doctor recalled, was young, quote, young, timid, and she thought, and he, Bert, made her believe she was sexually inadequate because she couldn't climax at the exact same time as her husband, end quote. Like this particular woman, young woman, the doctor went on to say, quote, women who think they're inadequate are very susceptible, end quote. After telling the young woman that love surgery should not have been recommended, the physician was able to convince her as to cancel the surgery, as well as convinced her to write a letter to the Montgomery County Medical Society, as well as to the hospital where Bert um, exclusively operated because it was the only one that actually at that point let him have full um, surgical privileges, St. Elizabeth Medical Center. The physician then added her own letter and those of several others regarding Bert's non-selective use and aggressive pushing of love surgery. So in response, the County Medical Society looked into love surgery, including by asking the Dean of um, Wright State University's medical school to read the book. And I will just say he does not have kind words for the book and his evaluation of it. So in part, they, they start evaluating love surgery in part by having read the book. And in July, 1978, they decide to label it as quote, undocumented by ordinary standards of scientific reporting and a not generally gynecologically acceptable procedure, end quote the results of which, quote, had not been duplicated by physicians and which had only been described in non-scientific literature, end quote. The society sent this statement to local hospitals, including St. Elizabeth's, the only hospital again where Bert had full privileges. But Bert was already on the radar, so to speak, of St. E's, which is how it was colloquially, how it was known locally, or at least those physicians on the tissue committee, the hospital committee of, responsible for evaluating post-surgical um, uh, the post-surgical outcomes. And when it came to Bert, this committee was concerned and not just because of love surgery, um, Bert was also using DNC um, on young girls, on 13 and 12 year olds. Um, and so they were already, and he was, because he suspected cancer and for various other, 
they were already concerned about some of his surgical practices. So in addition to love surgery, they, the tissue committee had other concerns about his surgical practices. So perhaps then under pressure from the local medical society and a few alarmed physicians, including those on the tissue committee, Sainese begin to examine um, Bert's use of love surgery as well. I don't have to go, uh, I don't have time to go into the back and forth between the tissue committee and Dr. Burt, um, but let's just say Dr. Burt was not pleased that the tissue committee he felt was harassing him. Um, so in summary though, the tissue committee requested that Burt conduct a scientific study of love surgery to document that it, as he claimed, benefited women. So with the help of a local psychiatrist, Arthur Schramm, Burt conducted a word association questionnaire that women took before and then after love surgery to document love surgery's positive effects on the female psyche. I'm gonna say one of the questions he was asking and one of the questions he found that there was a benefit was um, husbands hit their wives less after they'd had this surgery was one of the things he was showing as a benefit. So was a word association questionnaire what the executive committee then at, and the tissue committee at St. E's was looking for to provide evidence regarding Burt's claim that the surgery was beneficial. The record available, and I'm gonna say that's what's publicly available because of lawsuits, which is why I have so much of this information it's because a number of women sued and went all the way to the Ohio State Supreme Court. And so all of those documents were preserved then by the court. Um, what happens after that actually sadly is not preserved by those sorts of records. So it's unclear whether the information from this questionnaire that Bert was giving his patients was enough for the tissue committee to settle their concerns. But anecdotally from other things I've found, it does not appear that that was truly satisfying for the tissue committee. And they kept sort of looking at his work through the 1980s. So perhaps not satisfied with the evidence produced from the word association method, or perhaps an effort to appease both Bert and his critics. In July, 1979, St. E's told Bert to provide quote, scientific statistical documentation of the results of your procedure represented by a sequential listing of cases over a period of four years. In addition, St. E's informed Bert he must use a special consent form to be signed before women underwent surgery, here, here called female coital area reconstruction. And this, again, this is the letter saying, requesting him to use a special consent form. The consent form appears largely derived from the statement issued a year earlier by the County Medical Society. And it read, dear, this is how, what you're supposed, this was the consent form part. Dear patient, the executive committee, the medical staff of St. Elizabeth Medical Center wishes, you, wishes to inform you that female coital area reconstruction surgery you're about to undergo is not documented by ordinary standards of scientific reporting and publication, not a generally acceptable procedure, accepted procedure, as yet not duplicated by other investigations, detailed only in nine scientific literature, and that you should be informed that the executive committee of the medical staff considers the aforementioned procedure an unproven, non-standard practice of gynecology. Bert then begins using the special consent form and also begins to accumulate the information desired by the executive committee. Bert too sees a benefit in this um, gathering of information because it would provide him, he felt, with further research, research to show the benefits of love surgery. However, Bert also saw the insistence for this documentation for what it was as well, which is a form of peer oversight, one that indicated a lack of trust in his medical judgment and one that he very much vocally resented. So the stock assumptions regarding this case that Bert performed love surgery without consent, performed experimental surgery on women, or that his Dayton peers abdicated their responsibility by not stopping him, do not fully explain what happened in this case. Indeed, the stock assumptions turn out in many ways to be historically wrong, or at least lacking the appreciation of the messiness of history. As I have briefly outlined here, there were a variety of actions his peers took and did take, ones that constrained in some ways and contained his practice of medicine. Local peers disagreed, for example, with his recommendations for surgery of individual women. The County Medical Society issued a statement against it. The tissue committee of the hospital where he worked made him both collect data as well as use a very not common surgery specific consent form, all of which are forms of medical peer review of medical oversight. In some ways then medical peer review of BERT worked. If by worked, we mean that physicians brought their concerns forward in the expected manner. They told each other their concerns. They didn't recommend patients to go to James BERT. They raise issues with relevant committees and societies. 
They issued a statement critical of an elective surgery. They insisted on a special consent form regarding surgery, as well as data to confirm the surgery did what Bert was claiming it would do. But it was the former patients, those women who stirred, sued Bert for medical malpractice, who went on national television to tell their story when the local medical society, when, excuse me, the state medical society was not listening to their concerns, who spoke to the local press. It was the actions of former patients, not doctors in Dayton, who forced the Ohio State Medical Board to act. So it's the pressure placed on the state board from the general public, not Bert's peers, that ultimately resulted in Bert being forced to give up his license, his right to practice medicine in early 1989. So medicine enjoys a great deal of professional autonomy and with, understand, with the understanding that it will self-regulate. But in the Burt case, as is often today, it's patients or the general public who are the ones to raise a complaint against a physician for professional misconduct rather than another physician. Indeed, one recent study found that 66% of complaints originated from the general public compared with only 5% from physicians. The Burt story then illustrates this continuing limitation and continuing problem regarding medical regulation and medical peer review. So, thank you. I will stop share so I can see more people. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sarah. That was a fascinating talk. I am sure there are uh, plenty of questions because that um, it just unravels a whole bunch of interesting sequelae there and that's a really fascinating story um i want to give time let me let luke take the floor since he had his hand up and i'm going to mute while he asks whatever he is interested hey thanks um that was really interesting um one question i have for you is here and there we'll do a delivery on labor and delivery and a patient will ask for an enhancing procedure um, and it's not known as a love procedure, but I've heard it in different names and one, I see Dr. Cora nodding her head, but I've heard of the husband stitch mm -hmm. before. Um, so how would you handle when you deliver the baby 50% time with a first time mom, there will be a tear and you're doing a standard repair and the patient will look at you and say, can you do a quick husband stitch? All right. So the woman's asking for the husband stitch. I've had that happen one time. I'm not sure Dr. Kaur has had it differently, but the woman looks at you and says, can you please place a husband stitch? Okay. So I actually have a, um, I'm working actually on a history of the husband stitch, which is why I'm curious that you're saying the woman was saying that because oftentimes it's coming like it's the husband saying, would you put in some extra stitches? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. More um, commonly it is. And I, you know, I've heard more commonly, yes, you're right, but it's done usually as a joke, it's not, not very good joke. Yeah. Um, well, they'll say something like that, um, which I just kind of blatantly ignore. Um, but when the woman says that, how do you handle it? How to handle it? So I guess one could be, do you, I mean, so briefly, my read on the husband stitch as a concept, because it doesn't, it's never medically described, right? Nobody's sort of physically like, I've done a study on the, the husband stitch, but it's, it comes from a critique that particularly feminist health activists in the 1970s were talking about episiotomy and episiotomy repair, not shouldn't be routine. And it was routine. Like I said, it was, there were hospitals with 90% rates for episiotomy and episiotomy repair in the 1970s. So the critique was it's, it shouldn't be routine. That critique then moves to saying there's something particularly sexist about this procedure. And then it's meant to sort of enhance male sexual response, that that's really why the underlying sort of insidious reason that physicians, male physicians, because it's largely male OBs in the 70s, um, male physicians are doing this procedure not for the benefit of the woman or the baby, but for her presumed male partner. So the husband stitch is supposedly like an extra stitch or so in the PCM repair. There's no real, if for evidence, we're looking for like, again, a physician writing about like, I've been doing extra stitches and this is the outcome. That doesn't appear to exist. But to me, it's the critique of episiotomy repair as being not about the woman, but about the man that makes it, um, that's the power of calling it the husband stitch, which is why I was saying it's interesting that it's the woman, because typically it's been a critique of it as being, this isn't about my body. This is about someone else's sexual response that you're using my body to like achieve that end. Um, 
And I, so I suppose I know I've read where doctors like it doesn't exist. It's not a real thing. This is, it's an episiotomy repair or a repair on the tear. Yeah, and I suppose it goes back to you of saying, does it actually do anything to say, like, if I give you one more stitch, or I know other doctors I've spoken with are like, there's, it doesn't really make sense because it's not like you're like adding another stitch. It's one sort of movement of stitching. So conceptually, but I'm gonna stop there. Does that kind of answer what you're gonna say to her? I suppose it would, my question would be like, why? <laughs> Um, I suppose it, it goes back to this fear of the other, the parallel fear of that vaginas are supposed to be a certain way, like they're supposed to be tighter, as opposed to thinking the organ is a, it's an adjustable organ, like it's not a static organ, it doesn't just stay, that's why it can deliver a baby <laughs> with the head the side of a bowling ball, it can expand to that, so it also can contract. But I think that's, I mean, there's, there, this is a very big, like, what role does cosmetic um, gynecology have in the field? I mean, like labiaplasties and you know, it's a very lucrative thing. And, and, yeah. and I have known very well intending your gynecologist, like, just have made this career over doing things. And I think that um, it's fascinating. And, and I think that your gynecology, for example, is a novel field and that it's more recent, uh, but they have developed like informed consents over this. Um, over these um, procedures. And you know, now we have something called the Mona Lisa, which is designed to help genital urinary syndrome of menopause. Um, so really kind of marketing kind of women's health as a um, as more of a cosmesis aesthetic looking field. Um, and so I think that um, it's, it's an interesting thing when, of course, like, I don't think anyone would have, like, Dr. Burke and genital mutilation, like there's no question about that in my opinion, but I think it, the harder question is, is what it, and one of this is self um, requested. So I go back though to, um, and I will say there were some, a, a group of physicians were in Dayton, Ohio that then go on and write a book about labiaplasty. And in their book, they literally say, this is not love surgery. So there's obviously some sort of referencing back to James Bird. He's not like a, he's not a complete outlier that he is, his name and what he did wasn't completely. That said, I have not found anyone claiming they're doing love surgery. It doesn't appear to have ever taken off in, in his form. But to what you're saying, to me, I draw a parallel with Bert and that both sort of genital surgeries today as well as then, both have a conceptualization of there being a correct female body and that surgery can get you a, and that, that's a one sort of correct female body. Like this is how female bodies are supposed to be, which was very much sort of James Burt's idea. I mean, his whole idea was female, body, female bodies were pathological, I and mean, he actually calls them pathological in his book. So in the same sense of saying surgery can make you better because your body is not correct. And I see that as the continuation from James Burt with the current labiaplasty. Okay, I'm going to open it up to Peggy. I'm, uh, Sarah, I'm glad that you um, ended the talk early enough to answer the questions because this is obviously a very uh, fascinating area with a lot of um, uh, interesting discussion. So I'm going to let Peggy take it away so we can get to everybody. Um, if, Julie, if, if you have a follow-up to Luke's question, I'm happy to cede to you and then get, come back to me. Um, it's related but different. So no, I'll, I'll, I'll hold. Thank okay. you so much. So, so the, I have two questions. The first is, I, I'm just curious, um, your, I don't know, rhetorical choice, shall we say, about to decide to call these things the love surgery and the love doctor mm -hmm. and um, how you thought about, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure you thought about that. So I'm curious how you came to that. And then I have one other question. So I'm using love surgery and love doctor because that's what he called himself. He, he went on radio shows calling himself the love surgeon or the love doctor. His book was called Surgery of Love. He marketed it as Surgery of Love. So I'm, I am purely running with his own um, words not as an endorsement, but just to say like, I'm using them as how he, this, is, this was his phrasing. Okay. I, I mean, it seems, it seems a peculiar um, amount of uh, easily to easily assumed endorsement. I mean, obviously, once somebody starts to read, they, they don't, they see things differently, but uh, okay. <laughs> um, 
the the other comment is is it's so interesting to me how this uh in many ways parallels the lobotomy surgery so lobotomy is a, is a little different um in a couple of ways one is that you know it was it was touted with um probably not current uh, standards of, of data, but it was touted enough that it, it won um, Moniz the Nobel Prize. Uh, and then it got used by Walter Freeman in a way that, um, so it was touted or it was invented as the leucotomy by Moniz and then used as a lobotomy by Walter Freeman. And Walter Freeman had m many of the same characteristics that you're saying about Bert. He was aggressive about doing this. He was unselective. Um, and what was the third one? Uh, oh, he, ha he had a complete lack of decorum. Um, you know, he was doing this in buses and uh, inappropriate places. Um, and, and there, it, the, the patients themselves were actually incap incapacitated to make a case for themselves. So they couldn't, um, to a certain extent, the people around them did. Um, but do you, do you have any thoughts about the parallels there? Uh, it, it doesn't have the sex, you know, the sexism thread. Um, it has a little bit of a thread of, I don't know, disabilityism. Um, any thoughts there? So I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the case you're referring to. So did, did patients come to him or was this that he was saying? Like, oh, well, he, he, he went all over the place. He went to people that were vulnerable um, in facilities um, and just did lobotomies on them. Um, he, there was a great book by Howard Dulley about called My Lobotomy. He was a, about a 13 year old kid when his stepmother was annoyed with him and um, arranged for Freeman to do a lobotomy in the in the doctor's office. Um, he did it with an ice pick. It, it's it's a it's a gruesome story, but it has it has much of the same feel as the Burt story, where it there's a there's a way that you could construe it as coming out of science, at least at at the start. And then all hell breaks loose, and it's um, it, it can no longer be construed as for the good of anyone. So, I guess the the one sort of, and I agree, they're not exact links, other than sort of thinking that both. I'm going to say the person you're speaking of and Bert both fundamentally believed in what they were doing, as being something that was actually for the good of the patients. And then it sounds like with the person you're speaking of, and I'll say with the doctors in Dayton, right? Nobody picks up this surgery as far as I can tell, which is another form of peer review, right? If, if the surgery appears to be working, one of the sort of scientific process when you talk about surgery or other clinical forms of care is to say like, oh, I agree with what you're doing and I see the good outcomes. And I don't know about your doctor, but I think also, obviously it depends. We know it depends on who the physician is. Like if you're a noted sort of person who's respected and well-published and high up in their career, you'll probably be given a little bit more cushion than if you will, if you're somebody who, Bert was notoriously uh, not good with communicating with his fellow doctors. Like he was, he notoriously wasn't good at sort of committee meetings. Like if he had been a different persona, maybe love surgery would have taken off among them because he would have been seen as a trusted peer. So for Bert, at least part of the wall, he put up himself in some ways by not being a trusted peer, but to loop back to the scientific process, at least with surgery and other clinical care that starts in the clinical encounter, sometimes the process is again, right? That um, that works and other people will pick it up and, or that, uh, -uh that doesn't seem to make any sense. So nobody else is gonna pick up what you're doing. And that again is another form of peer review of saying, and maybe the lobotomy too, at some level, does go that route too, right? I think it's for some good. of them. Yeah, it's a slightly different thing because the leucotomy was being used everywhere, including by yeah. all the academic centers. It just won the Nobel Prize. So yeah. Fulton, for example, is a very famous neurosurgeon and he was doing it 
right, left, and center at Yale, but he was doing a leucotomy in a sterile situation, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I think it would be interesting for you to see and compare those histories. It's, it's just, um, it's striking how parallel they are. It, it does go then to, uh, bad then we can, um, right, that sometimes it won't, because this is one of, one of the doctors I interviewed for, for this book told me, and I took it to heart when he said, you know, sometimes it takes a while to figure out that something's not working, or you have to see several patients before you're making the link to say like, this is what's wrong, but you have to, someone else has to look at those patients. So obviously there's a difference between lobotomy, which was being used much more widespread than something like love surgery. They both have their problems because one becomes accepted wide, really fast before then people are like, and really widely before somebody's like, hold on, we need to look at the data or is this the best idea? Sometimes it's gonna happen earlier, like with the case of Bert, it still takes a long time, but it's largely contained, if you will, within one city. So it, to me, it's just sort of the, and I think for especially, and I will say this too, I went into this story being like, why didn't doctors do more quickly? And went out thinking at a certain level, it went as fast as it could have. Like that, but that at the end, you still have patients that are suffering. You still have decades of patients saying like, I was harmed, I can't have vaginal sex. I have constant infections. Like I, I'm embarrassed about my body. Like that this, they're never, that hurt is never gonna go away. So it's this, it's this, I find it to be, an, a, and I don't know how to rectify tension. I have one idea actually, but I've rectified this tension of how do you, how do you sort of, how do you gather this data more quickly, essentially, for something like this to ensure that fewer patients are harmed by it. And the lobotomy is a different where it's, it seems right away like, oh, this is brilliant. Everyone's like, this is a good idea. It seems to work. It gets taken up really quickly in a way that's an opposite problem of how do you take something that's seen as normative medicine and it's a standard of care and pull that back and say, okay, there's no good evidence to show that we should be doing this. And that in itself can take a long time. I just taught on um, thalidomide and DES and right, there's a paper in 1953, I think about DES of being like, it's not preventing miscarriages, stop using it. And it doesn't get stopped being used until 71. So there's a 20 year gap between literally there's like, there is no evidence, stop using this. And physicians then being told by the FDA, don't, do not prescribe this drug for. Oh, and you're, you're muted, Peggy. <laughs> It got stopped being used because of Francis Kelsey from, who was a graduate of New Chicago. Yeah, um, the I did. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I, I, I'm gonna stop talking, but I, the one thing I would say is that be very, very suspicious of things that make a lot of sense. Um, things that have, make a lot of sense can go like wildfire and they, they <laughs> don't necessarily deserve to. Sounds great. I'm going to turn the um, floor over to Tarek. Yes. So my question would be, is more from a, like a policy standpoint uh, that from a procedure or surgery standpoint, unlike medication and devices, there's no control. Anyone can do anything. And also even you bring the point of informed consent, that doesn't work because patient doesn't know enough. And that will not save anyone from doing that all over again. Uh, so the question would be, do we need uh, issues similar to publics or teachers or even uh, policemen? There's, it's one-to-one -one interaction and it's always hearsay. He said, she said, it never gets settled. And just like there's a blue wall of silence, maybe there's a white wall of silence, people don't complain. So do we need, number one, a more documentation, more like a webcam when people or patient and uh, physician interact? Do we need to record all the procedures? I can tell you that the surgery that's being done is not that well documented because all dot phrases now, they all chip in few words and it looks like it looks same. And it goes to the same point, the, the complication one surgeon has, even though it's an established surgery, is not gonna be the same when the other surgeon does because it's a skill thing. So that consent doesn't work anyway. Consent that's documented in the tertiary center or a, control trial done by experienced surgeon is not gonna be the same who's fresh out. So my point would be basically, should there be a different uh, speaker program like anonymous where physicians, because again, nurses are working them, nobody complain. 
Look, forget the physicians, even nurses working with the, that surgeon did not complain. So the question would be just like NTSB, do all, everyone need to be audited by independent person, not employed by the hospital who have vested interest in keep making the money uh, and should all surgeon physicians should carry a credit rating, how much complications they are carrying along with all, all the surgeries they do, which should be public knowledge so patient can access it. Because nothing changed. We are not changing the system. No point giving anecdotes if you're not changing the system. So what's the way forward? Um, uh, thank you. I was thinking while you were saying this about the informed consent and um, in the late 1970s, I'm blanking on who said this, but there was an article, I think it was in JAMA, where one person said, there's no FDA for surgery, for your point, right? There's no sort of, you don't, and, and for your point also, it matters your skill set on how well you did the surgery, which is the point of there's no FDA for surgery. It's really difficult to do a surgical evaluation if you've got a variation of skill sets of surgeons or experience or length of doing the surgery to actually give a, or, or bodies, because obviously people's bodies can be radically different and you might have to make an adjustment in surgery because of somebody's body. So all of that said, um, I think the issue of informed consent and speaking first about BERT and then more broadly to one of your points, to me, the informed consent form that they used for James Burt was um, a cop out by the hospital, I'll put it that way. Um, I, I did learn this from my father who used to be a trial attorney, uh, that a consent form at that level in that era was really rare. Like having something be that consent specific to a surgery like that was not a common thing for hospitals to do. And he used to represent hospitals. Um, so to say then that they gave an informed consent, unless you know that it matters that it's not been documented in scientific literature and your doctor who you trust is standing there saying you should form this, you're not going to say like, I mean, maybe he could just say like, oh, I just haven't published yet, right? So a lot of times the bottom line of this, it's trust in the physician that the consent form is kind of with that, right? If I don't have consent, if I don't have trust in the physician, no amount of informed consent forms necessarily are going to change whether or not I want to do the surgery or not to one point. To your second point, Tark, I would say, um, this was suggested to me by somebody, or one thing, I've given, I did a, um, an, um, an obstetrics fellowship program, they read my book, and then we had a book club meeting about the book. And a lot of them were then saying, you know, do I have to tell my, I've thought about this a lot. Do I tell my patients if I'm using a different type of method for stitching them up? Is that a different surgery then? Like, how do, how do I sort of explain if it's maybe, maybe it, what's different enough to actually say like, I need to get a consent for this because it's different enough from what is standard. And then even thinking what is standard when we talk about surgery? So I recognize all the complexities of that per year sort of how do physicians then go about trying to say like, mm, this is, this is uncomfortable for me. I think this is really beyond standard or, and someone else suggested this to me. So I'm not going to take credit here. It shouldn't be up to the individual doctors. There should be some, as you're saying, like outside entity, or there should be somewhere the physician then says to maybe their, um, their employer, their hospital, or their university and says, I am concerned about X. And then the institution is the one who then goes forward. So the physician doesn't have to be in the process or position because there might be saying like, well, maybe this is just how this doctor does it. This, they get re good results. It takes out the physician from the responsibility to be there and it goes to an institution and that institution that would talk to the other person's institution. So in a way, maybe like I was suggested to me, maybe this would reduce some of or actually up the reporting by physicians if, if they're concerned about um, a surgery or a, or a surgery specifically, but obviously on competence levels as well with people performing things. Uh, before yeah, and I go over to, go to ahead, Julie, Mindy. I just want to say one thing is that we're going to have a couple of other subsequent lectures. Um, Peter Angelos is going to talk about the role of surgical ethics in the history of surgery. And in a few weeks, we're going to have Shelly McKellar talking about last resort sentiments. So I think those are really interesting and important questions about just, you know, surgical technique and surgical experimentation and how do you do that in a meaningful way and we're not even get, oh, there's Peter, He's, you know, just giving a shout out to him. But I wanted to finish up, I want to make sure Julie and Carolyn get to talk because they were waiting and I'm interested in hearing 
the view from the gynecologist, the OB gyne. So, yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I am an OBGYN on faculty at the McLean Center. Um, two little quick tidbits. One is um, uh, thalidomide is linked to, has a U Chicago connection, as does DES. And Arthur Herbst, um, uh, our former department chair, um, was instrumental in um, identifying the association between DES and um, cervical vaginal cancer. So um, that's a, another connection. And then um, as you were describing um, the surgeries and uh, including the husband stitch, um, it brought me back a little PTSD from a, a residency. And I was a resident from 2004 to 2008. And I will say just anecdotally, um, one of the most shocking uh, experiences of my residency training was having a female um, attending um, who still routinely did episiotomies, routinely did enemas, and routinely talked about the husband stitch. Um, and so um, that was certainly fading out of favor, but um, there are still there at least were some holdouts in 2004 through eight, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if there were some to this day. Um, but my kind of larger comment is that I do a lot of work um, around pelvic examinations, and I do see um, your work as kind of falling into the broader context also of consent around um, just pelvic care in general, and also um, linking to um, you know, the recent cases that have come out of Michigan State um, and uh, what was it, USC, um, of disclosures of, of physicians, gynecologists and um, sports medicine um, physicians, um, and they're uh, doing examinations without consent um, uh, around the genitalia. And I, I think that there is kind of this broader context. I, I do think it's different than, um, I, I understand some parallels to the um, lobotomy, but I also see that this is, is quite distinct in terms of the um, kind of the, the space around um, uh, female genitalia. Um, but yeah, I, I was just curious to see what your thoughts are kind of in terms of contextualizing the love surgery and, and kind of the, the, um, the secrecy around that and kind of the response to the exposure of that um, within the broader context of, um, of pelvic exams and, and pelvic care. So two things quickly with the PCI memory. So it's not until 2006 that ACOG says it shouldn't be routine. Mm -hmm. So the fact that there, it's still being performed, which wouldn't, which kind of makes sense in that it's not until 2006, ACOG is like, nope, no more routine. And that's after multiple studies. In particular, there was a JAMA 2005 um, uh, meta-analysis that was like, this isn't, this is actually potentially resulting in worse tears. Yeah. Um, to your other, uh, I will say um, one of the, one of the, the Michigan State I've actually made comparison to the MSU case, in part because the comparison because it's actually reporters who are the it's the women coming yeah. forward and saying this is this is happening this is a problem, yeah. and it's the press that finally are the ones like believing them, and I see that in the Burt case of saying it originally the local press was very um, oh he's amazing the surgery is amazing and then it becomes more of um, pers I'm going to say believing and sort of discussing this as uh, a less sort of this is a great idea um, focus. Point here being, it profoundly concerns me as not just a historian, but as a person to think that the local press is being eroded because they are another form of peer of medical regulation. I mean, it's not just doctors that do medical regulation, as I've noted, right? This is patients also saying, and per Tarek, I think brought up nurses. There were actually nurses, some nurses quit over what Bert was doing, um, but they had a lot less power in the 1970s in the hospital situation. Uh, so it's, there, are, there are other voices essentially, if you will. Um, and I think the press is one of them. And going back to the MSU case and the exposure of one, it's women coming forward and saying, I was not asked if this could be done and I didn't want it to be done. And then second, also then saying, the press actually saying, I believe what you're saying and this should get more attention than it's been getting so far. I think there's also a failure on our parts as um, 
healthcare providers to educate our patients about what is and is not um, necessary, appropriate, um, right? A lot of people probably in the in the um, Burke case didn't know that this was not the norm or was not um, necessary. Um, and, and the same could be said um, uh, about a lot of the victims in Michigan State and other places. So I, I think that we, as healthcare providers, need to do a much better job of educating our patients around public health and um, and consent as well. Yeah, and and also feeling comfortable to talk about those issues too, which to me is one of the I find one. Of, well, there's many points of the Burt case I find to be distressing, but one is a lot of these women were unclear that something had radically changed about them. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and they kind of blame themselves, like, oh, I'm just not recovering well from the surgery or so sort of self-blame as opposed to saying like, maybe it went how he thought it was supposed to go, but it actually, I'm, I'm having some pretty severe, um, I mean, like I said, a lot of these women are having repeat infections and pain and yeah. So not trusting their own bodies, essentially. Uh, and not knowing about their own bodies. But thank you so much. This is such interesting work. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn, you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for this talk. I was just thinking about this idea you've repeated a few times about um, how physicians should be able or be encouraged to kind of come forward more often when they see a problem. So I wondered how your research intersects with like evaluations of whistleblower mechanisms and institutions and even in societies. Um, I mean, it strikes me as in a medical context that that might actually be more important really than the local press, just given the kind of, you know, sensitive nature of some of these um, issues. I, I'm just curious about that work. So only in the limited area, I'm going to say. Um, one of the things I did for my conclusion of my book was look and see like how are, how are what's the sort of mechanisms education wise for training doctors to say, if I see something, I'm supposed to say something. And I get that that's uncomfortable because you might not be sure that what I saw was actually what I think it was, or this person's higher up than I am and they know more than I do. Like I, I totally respect that this is not an easy process um, and or that you could have a lot of doubt about maybe, you know, being unclear that maybe you don't have enough information. I totally respect all of that. I'm also going to point out when sort of this is essentially taught many places, and I'm just going to use the, um, um, the I'm blanking on the name, but it's the federal sort of board of all medical, um, state medical boards, and I'm sorry, I'm blanking on what their name is, um, but the Federal Society of All State Medical Boards on their website where they essentially have anything in there, they've got a couple of sort of learning activities. And the only mention of this of sort of malpractice or concern is essentially like you student, your responsibility is to not perform it. There's nothing about my responsibility as a physician as part of peer review, right? That's why physicians get to self-regulate is the expectation that they will self-regulate. There's nothing about that responsibility. And I really don't think that's taught enough, like that there is a responsibility um, and in two or about maybe 10 years ago, there was some talk um, of concern, it was about 2008, because physicians were making the same sort of statements of saying, okay, with the banking failure, right, the feds were coming in saying we need better regulation, there was physician talk about maybe we're going to, if we don't clean up our act, so to speak, quote unquote, the feds are going to come in and try to regulate us and we don't want that to happen. So maybe we need to have better mechanisms in place. Yeah. Okay, before I do, Tim, it's the Federation of State Medical Boards. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> like, I only wrote about it for how long, and I'm like, I'm totally blanking on the <laughs> name. <laughs> we all have those. Tim, you're on deck. Hi, hey, thank you. Thanks so much for a fantastic talk. You can tell it was fantastic because you've unraveled so many uh, different problems in the healthcare system. And I come at it from the perspective of a surgeon and a large health system, chief medical officer, you know, executive type. And system problems do really lie at the bottom of a lot of this. And one of the, um, one of the issues in today's world would be the strength of the independent medical staff at a hospital. And if you have a strong independent medical staff, then 
all of like what Tariq was talking about, doing quality assurance and, and that sort of thing happens actually in a relatively robust manner now that there's an electronic medical record and you can sort of collect all that data relatively easily. Um, you know, when medical staffs are small and insular, um, then it becomes difficult because it might be your partner who you are doing um, peer review on. And that, that becomes really problematic, but that's the, that's the system that's been set up. It, you know, and it, it failed these women, I, I, I think, incredibly. And my question is, um, uh, to what degree do you impugn the medical staff in failing to perform their duties? And it seems as though they really kind of didn't care until he started advertising and getting in their pocketbook. And is that too, too easy of a jump for me to make? And then lastly, I want to um, lay out uh, an aphorism uh, that pathologists who were the tissue committee, basically, pathologists know everything, but um, uh, too late. Um, so they actually kind of, it sounds like they save the, they save the day because pathologists see everything that happens uh, in a hospital. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you. And I'm going to, I am actually going to say, I think some of the slower response from local physicians had more to do with the fact that Bert, I, I mentioned he was really popular. He promised pain-free births. He was still kind of, as far as I can tell, doing twilight sleep but to some level or his variation on twilight sleep. So he was promising pain-free, memory-free births, essentially. So a lot of women were attracted to that and did go to him. He was sort of popular, was popular. Um, but he also then, when the women who he was performing love surgery on them would come to him and say like, some women did say like, hey, I'm having pain or I have an infection. So he prescribed something or he would also tell them, you can't, you should not go to another doctor because they don't understand what I've, my practice. Um, they'll mess it up. So he also had a, I'm going to say a um, carrot stick approach for lack of a better, right? He was very sort of nurturing and caring, but also was really able to scare a lot of these women and to think they shouldn't see someone else. So I'm saying is there's a gap of time, essentially. A lot of these women stuck with him until some of them were just like, I am, no, I don't believe you, or I'm tired, you're, I'm not getting better. So they would go to another doctor. Well, then other doctors have to see other patients and have to say like, the pattern with this is this surgery. So I kind of think some of it's time, but also to your point, Tim, some of it's also, some of the women recall, Bert, or when they go to another doctor, doctors in Dayton would say like, oh, you've been to Bert and kind of leave it as that. So there was also kind of a, like a, mm, I'm not gonna go down that route. Um, or there was also kind of like a ha ha nudge nudge. He's really hyper interested in sex. and. He made that incredibly clear at doctors sort of events that he was, he wanted to be a sexual guru. He wore pink safari suits and he had like red lip couch in his office. I mean, he was very sort of like, look at me. I'm a, uh, he had swim parties in his pool without swimsuits. I mean, he was really trying to be like a certain persona in the 1970s. Um, so that said, some doctors then were just like, oh, it's kind of harmless, haha, this is just his obsession. But some then obviously did start saying, um, this is a problem. I'm gonna say the physician who then does actually first say like to that young woman, she was a resident. So that was the one to say, well, I don't think you should have this surgery. So it, it does start then happening of, of people saying like, okay, I'm hearing about this. But, but to my point being, sometimes it just takes time. And I think that for Bert, and I get that for now too, like some, you have to see a pattern. There has to be a pattern that you're seeing um, before you can maybe say like, the pattern is leading here <laughs> and I see what the problem is. Okay, Sarah, we're gonna have the last question from Scott Moses. So we can give you a few minutes of downtime after this, just uh, take a bathroom break. So I'm gonna let Scott take it away. Uh, thanks, Sarah. I, one of the things that I've always loved about your work is the way in which your description of the extraordinary w w and, and medical history in general will help us to potentially deal with the ordinary. So in your assessment now, how do you how, how would you like us to do the ordinary? What is what is appropriate consent either during the pregnancy or at the time of the delivery when we're doing a repair uh, and, and dovetailing with that question? In what ways do we want reproductive health care? Or, you know, I, I've always toyed with this notion of like, what is a vulnerable exam? Like, isn't all health care about vulnerable exams? And do we do we wish, as people who are interested in this field, 
to think that this is in fact sui generis or is it really like every other patient physician encounter? Um, so I think part of it is to me, consent, I, I find consent sort of the, like the form with the, with the hospital sort of saying here, you need to sign this um, to have abdicating the responsibility and that consent is a longer process. And that I think too often now we sort of fallen on the paper form of consent as opposed to thinking this is a discussion. I also think there's been too much pressure. Like if I consent, it's okay versus the principle of beneficence or non-maleficence and saying there's also these sorts of principles as a physician saying, I'm going to have a conversation with you about this, that these are your options. And I realize sometimes that's not a viable option, but to say as a sort of working standard of saying, of having the patient feel more like a participant or ha and having sort of a larger conversation about issues. And I get that there's a whole host of concerns like limited time and with a patient and, but to have it be, this would be my one quick answer to it, Scott, of saying, there needs to be a larger discussion because at least for me, for the Burt case and in other cases too, I think some of it is, is an assumption that, or an assumption that there doesn't need to be a conversation um, or that um, there hasn't been a conversation um, and that that, and going back to Julie's point of sort of educating and conversing, but also respecting the patient as being an equal participant. Now, obviously if I go to the doctor, I tell my students this all the time, it's like I go to the, I've, someone else has done my taxes for 25 years. I literally can't tell you because I go to him, I trust him. He, I could end up next year with the, you know, the feds coming at me and being like, you've been, <laughs> but I trust him as the expert, right? And I'm paying him as the expert. So I also get, there's a, there's part of me, if I'm at the doctor, I'm in your office because I don't know. And I'm probably scared. So then also, how do you work in a conversation with someone to help them understand their bodies, to help them understand their options? To help them understand they have choices because hopefully they do have some choices and it, it's a it's not necessarily a one-time conversation but a continuing conversation and i also get that you know you have to have a regular doctor and you have, i mean there's so this is in a way sort of expanding out medicine i suppose too yeah sorry but thank you very much for for your first comments i really appreciate them because one of my goals is to say like history does help us think about what's going on now <laughs> so so I just want to thank you personally, Sarah, and give you a little downtime before you come back and meet with the fellows and say that was an outstanding talk. And I'm so glad that you gave it because you definitely uh, not woke up this group because this is a very dynamic group, but clearly got the best out of a group of terrific, you know, scholars and colleagues. And I really appreciate it. So thank you very much. And we'll give you a little downtime before the next session. Well, thank you so much for having me. I, I, this was lovely. So thank you.